coming right there. <laughs> Oh, hey guys, I'm here with John Stryker Myers, right? You guys know him. He's our famous McAfee saw guy. John, thanks for being here. Good to we, be here. We are going to do a big uh, shout out and talk about uh, the old SOG uh, POWs, MIAs. But first, I got to give a shout out to our sponsor. All right, hey, there are dark clouds on the horizon. There are troubled times ahead, the future of this beautiful country we have here. Um, so if you're not currently putting stores away for the future, well, I, I encourage you to start doing that. But one of the other things I want uh, to encourage you to do is actually start eating this stuff. And what you'll find is not all brands are created equal. Uh, I love Nutrient Survival, uh, not just because it tastes good, and it does, but uh, you, know, you get over 40 nutrients with this thing. So one I'm knocking back right now out here doing yard work, right? You need energy for doing yard work, just like you're gonna have to do down the road. Um, I like the triple mac and cheese, right? You're looking at, and again, 40 nutrients. Let me make sure I quote this right. Um, 340 calories just here, 12 grams of protein. You add half a can of chicken to this, you're over 500 calories and you're over uh, 30 grams of protein. Just, just knocking this, but guys, that's a lot of good nutrition, but a lot of good energy, those calories that you can have in that body for when you gotta do this work. And, Guys, who doesn't like macaroni and cheese, right? The stuff is good. I mean, it's legitimately good food. A special ops grade chow to help you get through those, those troubled times. But honestly, me and my son, we knock this stuff back all the time, right? It's good food. It really is. It's good for you. It's going to give you that energy that you need to accomplish the mission. Nutrient survival. Check it out, NutrientSurvival.com. I got a promo code for it. Use TR10, it's gonna save you 10%. All right, hey, <clears throat> gents, this week we have brought John Stryker Myers. John, always a pleasure. Yes, sir. Those of you who are, have just crawled out from underneath a rock, uh, John is a famous author. How many books now? Three. Three books. Uh, that's not what. That's not what made him famous. What made John famous was John is one of the Mac V Saw guys from Vietnam. The heroes that I looked up to when uh, when I was that young boy, that young uh, man, even uh, very impressionable. Uh, <laughs> saw the movie The Green Berets. I wanted to go be a Green Beret, but once I joined the military, my uh, heroes were no longer. Uh, actors and people like that. They were the Mac V Saw guys from Vietnam that went before us. So uh, thank you for your service, sir, without a doubt. Um, well, thank you for continuing on. You know, we, uh, we you stood on our shoulders and you improved uh, things. I don't know about improved, but yeah, I, did. I did stand on your shoulders for 25 <laughs> years. I did. John has done other videos with us. You can find them in our video archive. Uh, we talked about the Mac V Saw gear that you uh, carried and everything. Good stuff. We've done a bunch of live streams. Something dear to your heart, though, is the current state of <clears throat> the POW MIA situation dealing with Vietnam, specifically your, your SOG brothers. So um, where do you want to go with this? Where do you want to start? It? Well, we could start, like in my, in my own personal case, how okay. um, for the last uh, 54 years it's been a heartburn for me and some of the men that served on our spike team, Idaho that later became RT, recon team. And no, we had the secret wars for eight years of Vietnam. And uh, all the Green Berets and many of the aviators that participated in it signed NDAs, the non-disclosure non agreements, that you agreement. couldn't talk about yep. it. So now we can. And uh, one of the, uh, the issues that uh, has been um, central to us has been the recovery of the remains of our people. Now, when you first showed up, your team, um, which had already been stood up for a while, it had been completely wiped out. They were gone. Correct. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, myself, Johnny McIntyre, and John Hutchins, we, get, we fly the South Vietnamese Air Force, flew us up to FOB-1 in Fubai. This was like May 20th, May 21st, right around there. Uh, we get off the King Bee, a recon team, Spike Team Idaho. Yep. Gets on the team leader. The one zero is Glenn Oliver Lane. The one one is Robert Owen, who had previous tours of duty in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. so on May first, when Robert left uh, South Carolina, he hitchhiked 
across the country to get to Washington. Um, and he left May 1st, hitchhiked, and the money he saved by hitchhiking, he sent home to his wife. He told his daughter, Robin, I'll be back for your birthday. So May 1st, he leaves, he goes to Vietnam, processes in. Um, because he's had experience, he gets assigned to MACV SOG, mm -hmm. gets on the Spike Team Idaho with Lane, gets inserted into a target, and remains MIA today. So Lane and Owen are two of the 50 Green Berets from the secret war, the eight-year secret war across the fence in Laos, Cambodia, and North Vietnam, who still are listed as uh, missing in action. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different technical terms, uh, bodies not returned, yeah. and all this kind of stuff. But for the general listening audience, missing in action. All right now, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the numbers, because I know my daughter wasn't even alive, she was one year old when the towers fell, but uh, to me, my first time combat was Desert Storm. 90% of my viewers weren't even allowed then, and we're going all the way back to <laughs> Vietnam. Uh, three, roughly 3.2 million Americans served in Southeast Asia, Vietnam. Uh, that's included the, the half a million sailors that were anchored offshores. Now, I want to get my numbers right here. Uh, 22,000 SF guys served with 5th Special Forces Group. They had the flag there, 5th Group headquarters, and then all the other groups rotated uh, Green Berets through there. Um, but out of those, 1,000 to 1,200 of them worked specifically with SOG. Correct. And out of those, it dep like you, you say, depending on which author you talk to, <laughs> Um, 600 to 750 of those did ops across the fence in other countries and uh, uh, total POW MIAs 1,584 as and of like, today yeah um, that's today yeah yeah and I just went to the website and um, looked up and you, you can pull up you can pull up the list of the ones that they're currently looking for and they put in the date that they've actually recovered remains and uh, which ones they're still looking for, which ones they found. And uh, that is um, Defense POW MIA Accountability Agency. Uh, that's the website and one well, the organization. And I'm scrolling through it uh, page by page trying to find the, the gentleman who I, I mentioned earlier that I'd done the funeral for and there is a there's 177 pages and these guys get one line yeah and there's a, so many people still missing out there there really are really are really are indeed and and on top of that we have um the other thing that's working against us now southeast asia has the most acidic soil in the world so not only do we have to get more attention focused on southeast asia vietnam missing in action mm -hmm. Uh, because as we as we go on, it'll be we'll talk about other things that the government's doing in Southeast Asia mm. from World War II. Yeah. But that's a little bit down the line. And uh, so this soil is literally destroying the evidence of future searches. So I'm not sure what the final time frame is, but I would estimate just from following this pro uh, this issue that's near and dear to our hearts, I'd say five to ten years, the soil will eventually eat up the bones. I don't know about the teeth. Yeah. Um, now, they have this large agency that does it. And uh, they're, DPA. They are, they're fairly well funded. They are. And they've oh, they got, are. They've got scientists. They've got... Uh, Labs. Yeah, they've, they've got tons of tools, resources. And the Vietnam government doesn't mind us going over there. They've got their own group that used to work with the Americans a lot. Right. Recovering um, the Vietnamese Office of Seeking Missing Persons is actually the name of it. And they're all about helping us. But well, and also to the credit of the Vietnamese. Yeah. In the last three or four years, um, the Vietnamese and even the Laotians to a, a lesser extent mm -hmm. have never been more cooperative. Um, they're working more with our people and um, they've done some searches on their own where our government has given them equipment, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, and technology, and maybe information, latest information, uh, where to go. So um, they have really come a long ways compared to the early days 
when they were suspicious of any American that came yeah, in there. Of course, there. yeah. And in the early days, the uh, the joint recovery teams that went in, they would sometimes would wind up in firefights mm -hmm. with the NVA because they thought maybe it was a SOG team that got lost or something. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but uh, you know, you never know. You right? never know. Never know. But um, they they've come a long way, so that's an improvement. And we also have the Defense Intelligence Agency, who um, its director recently and the previous director uh, Robert Ashley, who was a lieutenant general yeah. for DIA, said the primary mission with them is American POW MIAs from the Vietnam War in Southeast Asia. But that's changed here recently. Well, no, that's they've improved. And DIA, okay. they came into the picture later. Okay. I think it was around 1984. But they have each, each country, they have one or two uh, agents, or I'm not sure what their title is, but these guys are sharp. They speak the language, yeah. they know the country's uh, traditions, their customs, and they work there for, you know, for several years, and sometimes longer. There's no, as I understand, there's no two years you're out of here. DPAA, they do not do that. All right, um, how about a little background on the agencies that work there? Sure, uh, with DPAA, um, it was formed, now I think it would be, in September it would be five years ago. Okay. And they brought together three separate agencies. There was a lab in Hawaii, there's another one up in Ohio, and of course the great bureaucracy in Washington. Mm. And so these three were like working together, and there was an effort to bring them together, they formed DPAA. And, um, with that came a lot of issues, and the first director was Mike Lennington, uh, a three-star general who came in, and uh, he brought along some bureaucrats with him, and they started to set up the bureaucracy. And um, <clears throat> within a short period of time, he had people under him that were emphasizing breaking away from the South Vietnam effort to get our POW MIAs out. And I have a, yeah, it's, it's like, Why? Um, well, it goes back to federal government and yeah. agencies and bureaucracies that self-perpetrate. Mm -hmm. We want to build our agency. And so some of the bureaucrats that came in with Mike <clears throat> through the new agency, that was one of the ongoing battles. So publicly they're saying, hey, we were formed and uh, for this issue specifically. And again, just for a little more background, um, in the Vietnam War, during that war in 1969 and 70, and in 71, American citizens for the first time petitioned the government of the enemy that we were fighting to treat our POWs better. Yeah, I remember that because we were literally, the, we were gone, we had pulled out, but we still... No, we knew, were still there. Yeah, well, but we knew they had prisoners. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we knew they had prisoners, and... Uh, all right, so who, when you say civilians, what civilians were reaching out to that government? Well, at that time, there were people whose family members uh, okay. were acknowledged as POWs. They had received official notification. And by that time, we had many stories in newspapers that got out one way or the other saying, those communists mistreat our POWs all the time. And everybody knew it. Yeah. And uh, the only question was how bad. But that's where it all started. Oh, okay. So American POWs officially come home January, February 1973 with the flights and the, the uh, triumphant return. But one of the things they didn't talk about were the MIAs and people from the secret war, yeah. our guys, and others that may have disappeared in North Vietnam, pilots flying who were shot down not recovered mm -hmm. and uh, so that's part of today's MIA faction so the uh, there's a group of citizens that got together and they formed a, a citizens group and of course back then they were doing the bracelets POW yeah. MIA oh, bracelets yeah, the flags erased. everywhere that's what I grew up on as a kid the, the black and white POW MIA flag yeah. we will not forget that I, I grew up on that my whole life yeah indeed and that's iconic came out of the uh, League of POWMA families. Mm -hmm. They developed it. They never copyrighted it because they hoped that people would use it. Yeah. And so that image has been out there. So um, when our guys come home, the League 
National League of uh, National League of POW MIA families formed, and they continued to press our government, and the Vietnamese government, and the Laotian government, and the Cambodian governments to account for the still missing. And that began in the early 70s. Early 70s. And that went on. Of course, there was a great deal of frustration. They didn't trust us. We didn't trust them. Mm -hmm. Into the, through the 70s with Jimmy Carter. He was so busy screwing everything else up. <laughs> but it wasn't until Ronald Reagan that we got the emphasis back yeah. on our POW MIAs. And it was through him uh, that we all salute President Reagan and some of his key people. And uh, they were able to work and it began the initial steps forward to have better interaction. And around 83 or 84, DIA is, is into the picture now. They have agents in each country working. And, uh, and the league, the, uh, today's director is Ann Mills Griffith. She's been through three husbands. Director she, of the league. Of the National League yep. of POW MIA families. And she's been through three husbands. Her brother was shot down in an F-4 in September of 66. In, uh, off, the shore of, uh, off the shore of North Vietnam. And his remains were recovered, I think, three years ago. He was buried with full honors at Arlington. And during her tenure, she never petitioned people on behalf of her brother. This is a regular research that came up through some of the new technology that our government made available mm -hmm. with South Vietnam. Anyways, they returned. But Anne's been there from day one. Now, 80s and 90s, um, you said under Reagan, it became, we started working out much better. And I, I actually know some of the guys, um, when I went to the Q course, I had this guy named Ung. Ung was a f Cambodian, became an American citizen, was trying to earn his Green Beret, finally got it a couple years after <laughs> that. Long story. But he would tell me all the stories about him going over there with the U.S. government and uh, out of Hawaii. Now. Back then, they were they would talk to the old Vietnam vets and say, "Hey, this is where we lost saw him, or this is where the plane. This is how you need to. This is where you need to go search." Because I'm thinking you can't just run a whole country with a metal detector looking for no. pieces of a F4 <clears throat> Phantom. So, um, but then they got away from doing that. They did, and but um, and again, it's. It's difficult tracking people down. Yeah. Because like the secret war, everybody who participated, I mean, some of the career guys were in for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of guys like myself that were in three, three and a half, four years, got in, served, and then came home, went their way. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there were a lot of records, SOG records that were destroyed near the end of the war. I've interviewed a couple of guys, and I wish I'd kept their names because I remember one guy, uh, at the, when they closed Contum, CCC, his job for over a week was going through the files and destroying all the after action reports, destroying uh, mission Why? plans. Why? Sorry. Well, because it was top secret. It never happened. I never I happened. Got that, but, uh... And, you know, that with that war, I mean, Tricky Dick, President Nixon in September 1969, is on record at a press conference saying, We have no American stationed in Laos. That's true. Uh, that's, that's we true. weren't stationed there. Well, this, that's aside from the CIA, yeah. which had another secret war going on in the northwestern part of Laos. We won't yeah. talk about that secret war. <laughs> but for our secret war along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, yeah. Tricky Dick said we have no people there. We may have some advisors that might be helping to advise the local people. That would be the other secret war yeah. with the Mongs. But <laughs> for us, Tricky Dick is right there. And that was, that's what it was. I mean, when we ran our missions, you know, we went in sterile. No ID, no nothing. So uh, if we got captured or they got our body, there would be plausible deniability. Mm -hmm. He can't say he's American, particularly if he's dead. They don't talk about Yeah, you can't beat it out of them. Um, so how do they look for the bodies? Where do they get the idea well, of where to sit? Well, that's always the challenge. You know? and, and again, there are some key people at DPAA for the last 20 years that I know of and longer that have been key people that are in the bureaucracy that care. Mm -hmm. And they keep working with their leaders that have changing priorities. So for example, seven or eight years ago, within DPAA, there was 12 to 14 South Vietnam, Vietnam War case 
analysts, those numbers have been shrunk mm -hmm. to maybe three or four. And then if they, if they replace them, they replace them with archivists who's different than an analyst who's yeah, trained yeah. to look at files, talk to people, get evidence from people in layoffs or from us. And these key people are now honorary members of the Special Operations Association. They've been so honored for their years of working within that bureaucracy. Yeah. And they're there. They'll talk to our guys. They get maps. And if they hear anything, they'll get back to us. But that's at the low level. We're talking about the upper level yeah. today, which uh, now it's gone. As a bureaucracy, one of the things they like is numbers. Yeah, the way to get success more money, stories. Success stories. Yeah. So, like, uh, I, I went to their, the, what's it called again? The Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. They actually put out a weekly report. And uh, you can go to their website, check it out. But it had 50 posts on it, 50. And not a single one of them was Vietnam. It was all uh, World War II and um, Korean War. And, uh, and I, I understand if I was a politician and I'm wanting to make a name for myself, a bureaucrat, yeah. uh, you got to have success stories to justify that next pay raise you want. But um, it's sad that they're doing it on the shoulders of great heroes like you. If you don't understand what I'm talking about is instead of kicking through the jungles because somebody reported decades ago that that's where a, uh, a plane crashed that their uncle told them about. Uh, what they're doing is they're going to like mass graves from World War II Korea where the bodies aren't identified by name, but they know roughly the people that are all buried there. Easy to dig them up and then you identify them via DNA and everything else and they get their success story and it's so much easier so much more bang for the buck, as Ann would say it. Indeed. So. And what happened was, you know, this is the first time our government forms an agency specifically to recover South Vietnam War, yeah. MIA, and any POWs. So <clears throat> there was an article in SoftRep back in uh, 20, 2015. This is seven years ago. And the Hawaii Star Advertiser newspaper quoted then DPAA Deputy Director, Army Brigadier General Mark Spindler. Okay. So Spindler was quoted as saying <clears throat> that there were identifications made, and, but he went on to say, right now we're focusing on Southeast Asia in the near term, even though the cost is high. Spindler, who was appointed in September of that year, 2015, said DPA under Mike Lennington, who was the first director of DPA, will develop a campaign plan as part of a long-term plan where, quote, we know that we're going to shift probably in our main focus out of Southeast Asia and into the Pacific and World War II into Europe. Now, this is the third-ranking man at DPA. Yeah in uh, 2015, and he was never called for that, never challenged on it, but it also gives you insight on the mentality of DPA at that time, mm -hmm. yeah. and they've done it. So the emphasis is now on the going for the numbers, and we don't want to besmirce or downgrade anybody who brings home the remains, because yeah, 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 you know, DPA yeah. still talks about there's 88,000 missing in action for mm -hmm. all wars, World yeah. War II, Korea, Vietnam. Yeah. And, but at least 50,000 of those are over the sea where ships go down to the deep yeah. Johnny Jones mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And so it's an, out of that, there's 38, and there's mass sites, there's aircraft crash sites where they can go through, or sometimes they go to the punch bowl and they go in and they get remains out there. Now at the punch bowl, I'm told, every man, and every sailor, every Marine who's buried there, their name's up on a wall already. Yeah. But they come back and, and, and present it as a fresh case. And we don't want to take away from the other efforts, but what happens is now Vietnam, since Spindler publicly acknowledged that, 
the bureaucracy behind the scenes has been doing that. And it's very disheartening. I bet, you know, and I understand it's more <clears throat> expensive to go into the jungles there, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, that's where you got to go. It's, it's, it's where you have to go to So find think these about people. it. You're some kind of a mid management yuck yeah. that's tied into the bureaucracy now. Not, you don't have the spirit of the young teams. You know, these young teams, when they go out and get on the ground in Laos or Cambodia, these kids are good. Oh, I bet. I, I just, yeah. we, I want to clearly define the difference between mid level and upper level management yeah. and their bullshit and mm -hmm. the guys in the field. They're, they're phenomenal. They're dedicated. Once they get there, they get on the ground. Um, but um, once getting back <laughs> to this whole dichotomy, it's just brutal. It's watching. And here's a classic example. We had one of our recon teams, RT Delaware, has a bright light mission. So they went in. Jim Shorten Jones is 1-1, one, one, who mm -hmm. I can't remember right now. They go in with four brew. Uh, F-4 went down. And when the F-4 came in, Phantom Jet, Air Force. When it came in, it hit a mountaintop or hilltop, hit a second hilltop, and then it crashed and came to rest on a third hilltop. And uh, what people didn't realize when it crashed was that on the second hilltop, that F-4 went through a barracks that had been camouflaged, killed a lot of enemy. Inadvertently. Nice. <laughs> was it, which is cool. Yeah. You know, my favorite kind of commie, <laughs> dead. But, so Jim Shorten, they repel in, they get to the first hill, they get to the second hill, and now they have hundreds of NVA coming yeah, for them. Beehive's been kicked over right there. Yeah. Right. So they have to get out in order to survive. They, they get never pulled made it. out on strings. Okay. And so Jim then goes on, becomes a power rescue man in his spare time, becomes a doctor, he's, a, he's an x-ray tech, x-ray specialist, whatever a doctor is that specializes okay. in x-rays. Yep. He earned a lot of money. That mission stuck in the back of his head, it haunted him. This is after the war now. After the war. Around 20, 2002 or 2003. So this is decades later. Decades later. But he know, it's still fresh in his it head. Is, it's that, fresh. That F4 sitting there crossed on the third hill. He can still see it because he was hanging from a rope under a helicopter. To this day, he can still see he it. He can see it. All he right. goes in, spends $35,000 of his own money, flew to Cambodia, found a couple of guys that were familiar with the area, mm -hmm. forms a, a team to go in. They spend like two weeks or so trekking through the jungle. They get to the crash site, finally. When they get there, begin to work to try to find. Yeah. Uniformed bandits with AK-47s drove them out. So he had to leave. Yeah. Frustrated and pissed. Well, many years later, I forget what the year was, DPAA came back to Jim and said, hey, we heard you were there. Because Jim had made some rapport with DIA. Yeah. And there was a DPA person there, I forget. But we know DIA was there for sure. Okay. And so he missed... They say, hey, we're going to go back. Why don't you come with us? So Jim goes back. They get in. takes a long time to get there. He goes through the whole trek. Now he's in his 70s or like 69 or 70, right? And so he gets in. They get to the crash site. They're working on the second hill. He goes, hey, be advised. You want third hill. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> and so um, because they are finding bones yeah, and yeah, stuff, yeah. Yeah. but they didn't realize these are just bad guys. Yeah. But it also... He was there and explained it to the to the Vietnamese government. And that's the these are your people. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's the importance of actually having you guys there, right? Or at least pointing it out on the map. Hey, this is not where you need to be looking. You, that that rock skipped one more time. So to and, show you what a mm. character character uh, Jim is, he then stays there. He helps them. He's you know they have those sc metal screens. Yeah, sifting sifting sift. dirt. That's the word. He sifted him. He said, hey, would you, guys, would you hang with us for a couple more weeks? So Jim stayed with him two extra weeks, helping him sift through, look at stuff. Um, they didn't find much, but at least they worked on the right hill. Yeah. So they said, hey, we're done. We got to wrap it up, our time, the monsoons, whatever. He said, hey, when you go back, would you go back with us? We'll call you. So Jim goes, okay. He goes home. Last year, 
2021, he got an email or some kind of communication from one of his sources who said, hey, they just came back from your crash site. DPAA, who owed him so much yeah. for his cooperation, I, I wanted to say fuck him over, but we don't want to talk like that. Yeah. But he really screwed him. So they never called him back. So this is that mid-management, upper management, lack of integrity, lack of scruples, and Jim was pissed. But he's such a cool guy. I mean, he's just one of our amazing recon men. And just as a sidebar, yeah. he was in the Navy in Vietnam for a year. He really got to know the, the people, the country. He got bored, got out, joined Special Forces, got in the SOG, ran recon, got bored, got out, went in the Air Force as a pararescue man before he went to med school <laughs> to be an x-ray specialist. And he was really good. He made the radiologist. Thank yeah. you, sir. I'm, I'm not good in these you. big words. I'm here for you. That's why we paid a big yeah. buck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so Jim did it. And that's what, so that's one classic example of people wanting to help. And uh, in this case, they just screwed him over. So they're now, uh, we mentioned this before, the um, labs are basically dictating where to go look. Where they do. It should have been the analysts actually talking to people. Be yeah. I don't see how you can look at something in a Petri dish uh, at some lab in Hawaii and decide, you know, in, we need to move three kilometers east to this other part of the jungle. I don't, I don't see how they could ever get success doing that. Well, it's been one of these behind the scenes interagency battles mm -hmm. or inter-office battles that the public never hears about, but that's the net result. I think that if the analysts had been in charge, when they went back, Jim would have had a phone call mm -hmm. and given the option, do you want to go, yeah. yes or no? And Jim would have gone, even in his old decrepit state. Oh. <laughs> but he's one of my heroes. That's why yeah. Jim is one of my all-time heroes. One of your heroes. Yeah, in fact, if you go to SOGCAST number uh, two. Okay. SOGCAST number 002. If you're not familiar with what uh, John's talking about, he does SOGCAST. It's a podcast he does. Jocko helped you set all this up. Oh, it's all, yeah. all courtesy of Jocko yeah. Willink. He, yeah. uh, he pays for our equipment, pays for the flights to bring in SOG veterans. I interviewed them. We have 26 interviews in the can now. Nice. And Jim was the second one. Awesome. And uh, Jim, uh, we, his, his name was the Wild Carrot. That was his call sign, the Wild Carrot. Sogcasts, uh, John hosts that. So instead of him sitting in that chair, he's sitting in this one. Indeed. And uh, they're Not much, much you. better than these. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and in those Sogcasts, you know, uh, Jim talks about that. We, yeah. we, we get more details. So that's available on YouTube now. All right. And then the, uh, the audio is available on Spotify and Apple. Nice. Apple Podcast. So is there a, um, a golden, golden lining out of this? What, what good is coming out of uh, these searches now? Well, there have, again, because of the curse of the COVID mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, bureaucracy and the attitude of DS, you know, I don't care what they say publicly. Yeah. Anything publicly from them is just like whatever, whatever the Russians say. It's yeah. a lie. Just show me when the teams are going to go in, tell me where they're going, and let me know if they're going to go across the fence to deal with SOG people. Yeah. Because not only do we have the 50 Green Berets mm -hmm. that are still listed as, quote, MIA today from the Secret War, we have 83 aviators that they've been able to document. Mm -hmm. That's Army, Air Force, Marine Corps. Men who, from helicopter pilots, the Jolly Greens, uh, F-4 Phantom Jets, A-1 Sky Raiders. Yeah. And, of course, all the different helicopters. Yep. And not to mention the South Vietnamese Air Force. Yeah, your King The King Bees, our love, beloved King yeah. Bees. And mm -hmm. they all went down supporting us. I'm here today only because, only by the grace of the Lord and the great uh, air power. And so um, we're very discouraged. And um, the, uh, when I was president of the Special Operations Association, I worked with the Special Forces Association, and we formed a joint POW MIA committee, which has been chaired by uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Mike Taylor. Okay. And this committee has worked with the National League of POW, POW MIA families, mm -hmm. and they've worked with DPAA on a liaison front. But even now, we're discouraged with what's coming down, and uh, there is going to the league has had annual meetings. Well, this year's meeting in June had to be canceled. 
There's a lot of reasons for that, but it's canceled. But that committee, through Mike Taylor, is going to be coming out with more detailed criticism of the lack of movement for Southeast Asia Vietnam War veterans. And uh, that's a critical piece. Mm -hmm. And when that pops out, we, maybe we can come back and talk more about that later. Yeah, for sure. And don't forget, here's the other side of this thing we haven't even talked about yet. The families. The families. Because that's who this is really for. Absolutely. You know, it, um, you bringing home uh, the chunk of a bone that's got a little shrapnel in the heel of it, that's, that's not really honoring the guy. What honors him is the family. Let's have some closure for the family. Absolutely. So that's why we need to be doing yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, and there, there are some classic cases. Well, like, you know, uh, Robert Owen's daughter, Robin. Okay. You know, like, look at her. I mean, she would promise that her dad would be home. Mm -hmm. And he never came home. She's worked for years, as many family members have. And um, so this is like a double-edged sword in that if Mrs. Smith sends her boy Johnny, he becomes a Green Beret, gets assigned to SOG, they're pulling the top secret missions, and he's killed, and, his, and they can't get him out. Because we've had instances where the teams are under such intense enemy fire that those who are still alive have to get out mm -hmm. just to stay alive to come back yeah. and fight another day. Leaving so behind. they know the rough location. Yeah. We'll come back and get your son later. Sunday. And again, we don't know what happened because sometimes the NVA would come in, they would take the bodies, strip mm -hmm. them down, yeah. get it, whatever. Then they may, sometimes they would bury them, but they may take them somewhere else. Yeah. Or the local people, the indigenous people who live there, was stripped them down. Who knows what, if anything, they did with the body. So it's mm -hmm. virtually a mission impossible scenario. But with DIA talking to the locals and our people trying to help out wherever you can, I mean, it's um, very painful because you don't, the families never know what the truth is. Yeah. And here, so we had uh, Donnie Shu. That's one of my favorite stories. He. Um, he joined Special Forces. He goes to first group, gets assigned TDY to CCN. Okay. And yeah, so he gets put on RT Maryland. Maryland was the one zero was uh, um, uh, Don, let's see, Gunther T. Wald. He was the one zero. Guy named Brown was the one one. And Shu, because he's a new guy, gets put on the team. So November 3rd, the team gets in, they're on the ground. They set up an RON, rest overnight spot. Yeah. And Covey says, hey, be, be careful. There's a lot of enemy activity down there. They get overrun. All three Americans are killed. So no one in their families, when they get the notices, first, your, your loved one is MIA. Yeah. Okay, missing in action. And they'll say, missing in action in Vietnam. Then a few years later, it's like, missing in action, body not recovered. Again, the family never knows. Mm -hmm. They never know that their son was the tip of the spear in the secret war, which was the, which was the top military game at the time. And uh, so in Donnie's case, um, around about 2010 or 2009, DPA has some tips, and they were able to find some of the remains. Really? Yeah. Okay. And in uh, April of uh, 2011, April 30th, 2011, his remains came home and he flew into Charlotte, North Carolina. We were all there to greet him. And then the next day they had a service <clears throat> downtown in Concord, which is right next to Kannapolis, where he's from, and the streets were packed. Oh, I bet, yeah. And then uh, the following day, they had a motorcycle procession from the funeral home to his uh, funeral in Kannapolis it was nine miles long. Wow. We rode with the hearse <clears throat> and every street corner, every street, every bridge, people were there. But in talking to his sister, they never knew. She didn't have a clue. They didn't know anything about what her so, mother had done. And I know it was all classified and stuff, but um, Sometimes you guys would come home and tell the family members. Sometimes. Sometimes. But if we could find out yeah, who they if were. If we could find out who they were. Ah. 
because this is pre-internet. Yeah. You come home, you got Joe Bip the rag man. If you don't have that phone number, mm -hmm. you could dial information in Pull Dunk, Indiana. Yeah. How you how are you gonna find them? How are you gonna find the family? Yeah. Man, that's hard. And the hard. whole combo thing. And we, I mean, there's several other cases of our guys um, who finally, some of them, unfortunately, uh, were recovered. Um, like we had a case where we had um, um, two guys go to high school together. One's the president of his high school class. The other's the vice president in the Chicago area somewhere. Okay. And so um, the other guy's name is Alan Boyer. He's the vice president. They both go to different colleges. Alan goes to school up in Montana somewhere. And uh, he uh, got bored, like all of us. He gets bored with college, <laughs> signs up, becomes a Green Beret. He gets on uh, STS, March 1968, they get wiped out. So it's Brown, and uh, he had uh, a couple other team members, and uh, Again, the family knows nothing, and we've been in close contact with his sister because, um, well, so let me just get back to the other part of the story. The guy who's president, he then joins the Army, becomes a Green Beret, is an officer, gets the CCN. He wants to get a target in the area where his vice president from high school went MIA. That was his hope. Okay, yeah. Didn't work out. He was on RT Kansas when they were in Oscar 8, and I think it was August of 71. They had a special mission there. They went in heavy, and he was killed and was a Medal of Honor recipient. And uh, they were able, to, on a bright light, to get his body recovered. So he's recovered. He's buried at Arlington. Brown... His remains were picked up somehow and brought back to the States. And this is around 2015. I'm depending on my memory now. Yeah. But anyway, he comes back. And I have to give Mike Lennington credit. I'm not a big fan of Lennington. But on this case, Lennington pulled connections at Arlington so that Brown, Boyer, I'm sorry, Boyer, Alan Boyer, was buried within sight of Megan, who was his one zero yeah, yeah. and received the Medal of Honor. And they're both at Arlington today. So that's one of the positive stories. But his sister, yeah. you know, we've been, we've been close friends because before his remains were discovered, it's like everybody else. We, we don't know. Of course, the, she learned about the Special Operations mm -hmm. Association so that people like Spider Parks and Pat Watkins, all of our legends, who knew her brother and, and Brown, who was the one zero. Good guys, I mean, amazing Green Berets. And uh, so that's just like one small example, you know, the family side of the story. And that's, a, that's an important part of this, and it's why we gotta keep pushing this. We've got, we can't just let this lose focus from Vietnam, uh, that whole Southeast Asia, and just got, start looking other places. We got six, 10 years left before the soil tears everything up too Yeah, bad. and then maybe this, maybe at some point they'll have to make, make a command decision. Yeah. But at least be public about it. Because mm -hmm. right now, the way DPAA is working, they are, I mean, first of all, you have our men that were killed in action are service members, 58,000 plus mm -hmm. from the Vietnam War. But above that level, are the families of our MIAs yeah. who never heard about their people. Mm -hmm. And the government's in action today and what they're doing, they're screwing the most sacred of our families from Vietnam vets. The I would, that, yeah. I'll be inclined to use stronger language, but we're, the cameras are all in here. But that's, that's why it's such a gut-wrenching issue. And we could go on and on, but uh, you know, that's where our, our heart, like in my case, you know, I'm just a poor reporter and a writer, and okay. we have a family. But you're so doing we a big service to everybody keeping this alive. Because like you said, this was a, a lot of it was all classified. And uh, me growing up, even being in the military, even being a Green Beret, we still weren't hearing a lot about what you guys were doing. And you're sure. bringing that all the light now that it's unclassified. So how do we help? How do we help push them back in the correct direction 
to start bringing home uh, these Vietnam brothers and well, brothers that are lost? The first thing is to support the National League of POW MIA families. They're, they're up on the website. Ann is still at the job. She's 80 years old now. Is that Ann's? Ann Mills Griffiths. Okay. Right. And this is one tiger. She went through three husbands during her tenure as the CEO of working on behalf of the families of our MIAs and our POWs. And over the years, she's been relentless. She has many stories, um, but because she does not lie or bullshit, mm -hmm. she's now highly respected by and knows the family members of all or the majority of the leaders today in Vietnam and Laos, and to a lesser extent, maybe in Cambodia, but she knows the key people. Yeah. She's been dealing with them for 50 years. Yeah, so she could make this happen. Oh, yeah. All right, so if you want to support her, <clears throat> support John, support the cause, we've got to, we've got to bring these MIAs, uh, we've got to bring them home, we do. So uh, I'll give you guys the information down below in the description under the video. And uh, can you I bother you with one, more, t of one more tidbit? For you, I, the world. You said that, and you just reminded me of something that I uh, feel obligated. To speak in regards to Ann and Mike Taylor, okay. who is the chairman of the joint SOA, SFA, POW, MIA committee. Four years ago, Ann had worked with the North Vietnamese government and through DIA and a little bit of DPAA to have a meeting between SOG veterans and the NVA sapper teams that trained the for killer one teams. mission. The SOG killer SOG teams. SOG killer teams. Nice. She, she was one of the point people on this. So there was a joint mission to Southeast Asia. Where'd they hold the meeting? Um, it was up in Hanoi somewhere. Really? Yeah. No joke. Mike Taylor went to, he's supposed <laughs> to go with Spider Parks, but Spider, <laughs> he was injured. And I, I, we won't get into any details, but he could not fly yeah, for I, a while. I wouldn't want to go to that meeting, I don't Indeed. think. <laughs> but, oh, I know, but Mike Taylor did. Yeah. He went to the meeting and met the men who were trained to, to kill, and kill him. us. And... It was a fascinating meeting. I bet. And Mike pulled it off. He did a class act job. There's stories in soft rap on it, but nobody else cares about the yeah, Vietnam nobody War. Nobody cares about. There's the whole malaise. But Mike met them, and it was a, a fascinating time. And since then, I don't know if it's related or not. Of course, some of this is politics. You know that yeah. big ugly bear, China. Yeah. They're down there buying their way back into Southeast Asia in Laos, Cambodia and anywhere they can in Vietnam. So North Vietnam wants to stay independent of mm -hmm. those communists. Oh, I'll bet, yeah. So, but there's been increased cooperation, but Mike did it. And that was just an amazing- Yeah, because if anybody would know where a wiped out team was hidden, it would be the team that wiped them out. That was the hope. Yeah, and I know, hope. Uh, again, COVID yeah. has put a kink, but I haven't talked to Mike recently uh, on that specific follow-up. But well, we'll have to do a follow-up on that, indeed. we will. We'll have to do a follow-up on it. Thank you. Since the SOA, POW, MIA committee was formed, I've been a member of that. Mike has been the chairman. He's just done an outstanding job and uh, far better than anything I could have done. But I'm here today just on my own. I haven't I gotten clearance it. from anybody. I'm not you're here because you're one of my all-time heroes, and I didn't well, invite him. You. I invited you. Indeed. Well, but, I appreciate uh, that. That's okay. But you, you're here representing just Myself, yourself. my own opinion. And uh, I know Mike and the, and the committee is moving forward with uh, some more, uh, how public it'll go, I'm not sure. Awesome. But well, they're working on it. Mike, if uh, you're watching and uh, we can do anything to help you at all, let us know. And for everybody else watching, I, they're, the, they're gonna say the same as me. John, if there's ever anything that we can do to help uh, support you or the Vietnam vets, sincerely, you guys, and Mac saw guys, you're the, the heroes that I looked up to, all, all the Green Berets <clears throat> that went before me. Uh, I know a bunch of the legends that came after you, before me, uh, but uh, we all, every one of them, they'll tell you, yeah, hats off to the Mac Vesal guys, so. Amen, well thank you, Connie, yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. Dude, thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Airborne, sorry. Uh, guys, again, <laughs> uh, leave your comments below the video, and uh, you have great stuff. I will get your questions and comments to John. And uh, again, if you want to help out these different organizations, I'll have their contact information down in the description under the video. Y'all take care and shoot straight.
If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you don't miss out on anything.